All right. I, first of all, I'd like to welcome all of you to the reboot. I don't want to say resurrection because that doesn't go with our religion, but the reboot <laughs> of our Lunch and Learn series. It was very successful last year. I won't say last year, it's still 2020. From April to July, we had a series of 16 speakers on a variety of different topics. I thought I had retired in July, but Rabbi Resnick, when he came as our interim rabbi, um, asked to restart the series. He was able to get a bunch of speakers for December. At this point, we also have speakers lined up for a good part of January and February. And the rabbi has managed, if I can turn the phrase a little, he's managed to put his mouth where his money is. Uh, he has agreed to give the first talk. He has more than 30 years experience at Camp Ramah in the Berkshires. And I believe that's what he will be speaking about today. Rabbi, oh, I'm sorry, one last point. If you have any questions, if you can save them to the end or put them into the chat, and then I believe he'll be happy to answer them at the end of the presentation. All right, Rabbi, thank you. Great, thank you, Keith, and thank you everybody for coming on. Keith, you need to move over and give your wife a little space. No, it's she okay. she 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 hides. <laughs> so, what okay. were the things that you were talking about me while you thought I was gone? Yes, you're giving the sermon right now. Okay. Um, Miriam has her hand up. No. Miriam. No. 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 Oh, okay. Okay. It just yeah. appears. <laughs> That's no. What I saw. <laughs> no, it's just that I'm holding the iPad because I didn't want to lay down and leave. Okay. Okay. This is a tough audience, Rabbi. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yes, but you know, it's it's um, someone made a joke. We can just complain for an hour. So, being a camp director, um, I would say all you know what flows up. <laughs> and people like to complain and fetch. They love camp. They love their friends. They love their whatever. But if there was anything from, you know, uh, Rabbi, the fish sticks were a little cold at lunch today. <laughs> to why did the waterfront staff let my kids out five minutes early? Because, you know, they, the council will say because they were preparing another activity. I would say probably because you were making out with your girlfriend and the kids you know, caught you or something like that. Um, but people like to kvetch. And, um, and Come one, on. one of the joys of being a uh, camp director <laughs> is that I was able to solve lots of problems. Um, and uh, I, I often said there are no crises in camp, which is not true, but to, you know, an 18 year old counselor, something that might be going on in his or her bunk could be a crisis. Um, and I, I try to teach, like, use your vocabulary very carefully. Crisis is really, you know, somebody is about to have something terrible happen to them. Um, so as I'm babbling a little bit now, I, I actually wrote out uh, what I wanted to say a little bit, because um, after being in camp for 40 summers, uh, I could, you know, just babble away and talk about anything. Um, I feel very, very blessed that uh, I started my career in Ramah in 1977 um, at 475 Academy Road in Woodmere, a few blocks from the house I grew up in, and Rabbi Bert Cohen was the interim, di interim director, get it, interim, um, and he had a major influence on my life. His son and I uh, were great friends from Brandeis Day School. I didn't know what I was gonna do during the summer. It was already June. I had an interview in his house, half of it being done in Hebrew, which was very, uh, made me very, very nervous. Um, I only realized years later when I was a camp director, because I was male, I was gonna be hired no, because I was breathing because males are always hard to find uh, to work in camp. And that really started a love affair with Camp from the Berkshires. Um, indeed, I met my wife there. She was a counselor. I was her Roche da, um, and um, spent 40 summers there. The kids grew up there. Uh, two nights ago, annual dinner dance gala, um, which was done clearly uh, by Zoom and still, you know, part of that community. And one of the reasons I feel lucky that I was able to do that and blessed is that uh, summer camp works, it succeeds. And 
uh, if we look at the conservative movement um, where synagogues are, some are losing membership, some are merging, uh, Salman Schechter schools are merging or closing. USY numbers are much lower than they were 10 years ago. Um, the Ramah world is growing. Numbers increase almost every year. New camps over the last decade, new programs. Um, and uh, I think the brand of Ramah is a very powerful and successful one. And I think Jewish summer camp, that immersive experience taking the kids and i don't mean to say the following thing is a joke but as serious taking the kids away from their parents and letting them uh be on their own with incredible accessible role models um turns people into lifelong jews um so what i'm gonna do today is share some insights share some statistics um talk about nonprofit mission-driven camps. Uh, I think some of those lessons of success are completely applicable to a synagogue setting too. Um, and I like to start off by asking if, um, if people have been to camp, were they campers there ever? Did you ever serve on staff? Um, which camp it was? If you ever sent your children there? Um, just so I get a feel for what people might or might not know about summer residential camp. Any of you go to camp? Sandy. There was a place called Sedgwin, which in a way was somewhat of a, well, not really, a model of Vermont in a way. It was called the Central Jewish Institute. It was the camp of the Reconstructionist movement, really. <laughs> Uh, there were daily services. The camp, it was a huge camp. Uh, camps used to be three. I know when I went to camp in the late 40s, early 50s, most camps were three, 400 kids. Sedgwick was 1,200 kids. Wow. With two different size and six different camps within the camp and so on. Uh, there were Shabbos services. When I got a little bit older as a camp and I was by mitzvah already, we had a daily minion of about 15 or 20 people that would dive in every day with towels and trillin. There was always Jewish culture and so on. And this is starting 1946, before the state of Israel. And then Israel came along and things, you know, that was also incorporated into the program. Great. Charney, please. I went to um, Hebrew Educational Society camp. It was based in Brooklyn. But the summer camp was uh, three week programs and it was in Harriman, New York. But uh, I wasn't the ideal camper. It wasn't really for me. It was very rustic. And uh, I went unprepared, you know, not knowing what to do. And I didn't know you had to go and make your bed and things like that. And I got into trouble with the counselors. So fast forward, my daughter went to uh, Camp Lohican which had a lot of nice activities, not a, not a Jewish camp, a non-sectarian camp, and loved it, loved it. And my grandchildren went to um, Camp Judea last, in North Carolina, in North Carolina, North Carolina. Um, not this past summer, but the summer before, and they were planning on going again, and they loved it. Excellent. They were there for the intro to camp, which was only 10 days, and they were gonna go for a month this year. But you know yeah. what happened? And Charlie, they're outdoing you because I bet they're making their beds in camp. Yeah, <laughs> I think my daughter prepared them. You know, I said to the counselor, my mother doesn't pay good money to send me to camp to make the bed and sleep. And I got oh my God. <laughs> I, I don't want to tell you what we thought about those children who said things like that. That, that was me. <laughs> so all my friends here would not believe it because I'm not that type now, but I was as at 12. <laughs> Only to be topped, my youngest daughter um, said, had said to more than one counselor, do you know who my father is? Uh, <laughs> name dropper, huh? <laughs> the other two kids would introduce themselves. What's your name? They didn't have last names. They didn't want to know from me oh. during the summer. But the <laughs> third, like, you know. Anybody yeah. else? Joe. Break off mute, <laughs> Joe. I have a long camp background. I went to uh, Wellmet camp as a kid. Uh, I, I just loved it. 
Uh, afterwards, uh, Barbara and I worked at camp. Uh, we worked at Greylock for one year when Neil was little. Uh, he was a year old. And then we worked for a number of years at uh, Camp Pointel, which has uh, a strong uh, uh, Jewish uh, background. Uh, with their own egg Shabbats, kosher camp and all. So Greylock is like a fancy schmancy camp, no? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it didn't work out that well. I was just there for one, for one year and... Uh, I got you. We didn't, we didn't go hey. back for a num number of years to camping uh, till the Joe, kids were uh, for about eight or nine years. Joe, when were you at Pointel? I was at Pointel in the uh, 80s, um, maybe so, like 82 to 88 approximately. Okay, because I was there from 79 or 78 to... 85 was my last subject. Yes. Stephen, who was the director when you were there? Uh, Herb's um, Weig. Herb's Weig was the director. Uh, I was uh, division head first uh, at uh, Pointel, and then I went to their team camp, Lewis Village, where I worked on the waterfront, and I taught canoeing. Okay. Yeah, Stephen. I was there. I worked with, I, I was the same age as Stacy's Weig. We were in groups together and then we were counselors together really? up until I went to college. My last summer there was 85, which was um, my last, my summer going into freshman year of college. Great. Yeah, Herb's wife just passed away uh, recently, about a year ago. We were in touch with Stacy at that time. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Great. Shelley, please. Well, I'm Arthur. Okay, I don't. I, I know it shows up as Shelley, but I'm I Arthur. apologize profusely. That's okay. Shelley is a man's name too, isn't it? Yes. At least when we were growing up. So I had a completely different experience because my my father sent me to YMCA camp in 1960, and I said to him, <laughs> "Dad, why are you sending me?" To, I I knew what it stood for, and he said, "Son, I spoke to the camp director, and he said 50 percent of the kids that go there are Jewish," and I said, "I'll see that when I believe it." And guess what? He was right. I, I couldn't believe it. In my bunk of eight kids, there were four Jews. So that was really strange. At any rate, to get to the point, they had an interfaith service every Sunday morning. And they needed a Jewish kid who knew how to read Hebrew, which was me, even though I just started to learn at 10 or 11 how to read Hebrew. So they would run a service where they would alternate between a Christian prayer and a Jewish prayer. And it actually made my ties to Judaism stronger. Because uh, it was the first time I got to, like... I was in charge of that service on a, on a Sunday morning. I did the Jewish part. <laughs> I'm going to talk about leadership later because I think summer camps provide incredible opportunities for leadership for 10-year-olds, for 50-year-olds. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So um, when I was very young, I was sent to Camp Hemshek, which was quite an experience. It was one of these camps for... Uh, Pair, children of greeny, you know, greeners. <laughs> and um, we had to line up and sing before breakfast um, in Yiddish. And it was quite an experience. I didn't go back there. I did not love it, especially they had water that tasted like eggs. <laughs> it was you, in Liberty. But you remember um, it years later. And then um, I went to Camp Kenny Brook which was a lot of fun, but I had a car accident there. And because we were suing the camp, I had to leave there and I went to Camp <laughs> Pontiac. Very fancy, Camp Pontiac. And, uh, and that was it. My parents had a business and they had to work all summer. They had a kosher deli by the beach and um, they needed me away, so. Somebody have their hand up? We're good. Vicky okay. Gray. <laughs> so there's um, some real connections with summer camp, which is great. Uh, the first Jewish camp was founded in 1893, um, as Jews started coming in greater numbers to the United States. And camp provided this, you know, fresh air fund kind of experience of getting out of the city. Um, it started to grow more in the 1920s. Um, and at first, the Jewish camps were either, you know, supported by organizations or private, um, you know, a, a good 
well-run residential summer camp or day camp that's private is a, a great moneymaker. Um, and people have really become, become very wealthy off of, uh, of well-run summer camps. In fact, today, many of the camps that used to be mom and dad shops have been taken over. So there are you know, camp corporations that might be running eight to 10 camps and save money on, on certain scale on, in terms of uh, purchasing, um, but also in terms of lawyers and accountants and things like that. So the camping business certainly has changed from the 20s. Um, I often think about some of the kids that came up to Ramah, not the majority, but uh, who have a second home in the Hamptons or down the shore of New Jersey, or mm -hmm. the last 10 years I was in camp, homes up in Dutchess County, an hour, a half an hour from camp, uh, much less rustic than Camp Ramah, but they chose to come to camp. Um, in the 40s, when Sandy started going to camp, uh, the Jewish move, religious movement started to sponsor camps like Ramah, like the reform movement. Um, and those camps started and still continue to be first and foremost uh, educational recreational uh, enterprises um, in the uh, framework um, and the great setting of a summer camp. So today, there is an organization called Foundation for Jewish Camp. It was started by the Bildners, who actually sent two kids to Ramon the Berkshires. And I remember sitting with her 20 years ago about uh, uh, trying to decide, like, what should, what should the foundation work on? She was just beginning the idea, she and her husband, um, of establishing this foundation for Jewish Camp. They now are kind of like the premier address for all nonprofit Jewish camps. They have funding for um, $1,000 for an incentive to get kids to camp. They do a lot of educational programming um, and some staff training. And they say there are now well over 100,000 Jewish children and teens who are in summer camps, residential camps. They're just beginning to go into the day camp business. And there's a very large number of staff members who are uh, staffing those camps. Take you know this past summer aside. There are over 140 non-profit Jewish camps now. I think Sandy is correct. A lot of the camps are in the two, 300 range, maybe 200. Some, I'm gonna say like Vermont, California, New England, Berkshires are in the five to 600 campers at any given time. So, our census on a daily basis um, in camp was almost always between eight and 900 people, um, which is really like a small town. All the challenges, but all the successes and, and positives of, of running a small town too. Um, in the last 10 years or so, Jewish camp has become even hotter amongst philanthropists. So um, Ethel named this uh, talk, Your Best Investment. So we're going to talk about that a little, but have no fear. I'm not asking for donations and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But Foundation Jewish Camp, we're looking for donors like Steinhardt and Seagram and people who would donate millions of dollars to affect real change in summer camp. Um, when I first started as director, in 1990, we did very little fundraising. Tuition kind of covered the, uh, the budget. I remember before I started, we took out a loan the last day of camp when payroll was going out just to tide us over for a month because we had zero reserves. We had nothing in the bank and payroll was going out that day. Thankfully, camp, not just Berkshires, but I think most well-established camps, now have endowments. Um, they were all able to weather the storm of 2020. Um, uh, two nights ago at, our, at the Ramad dinner, the uh, director said there was a $3 million deficit. My guess is the budget is now north of 6 million. Um, and money was raised by either foundations, um, Life Foundation for Jewish Camp, by Harold Grinspoon, who runs the Grinspoon Institute any of you familiar with PJ Library? Yes. Yeah, we, right. we have a lot of connections there. Right, so, P, so Harold started that too. Harold is an incredible guy in his 80s, 
um, walks every day when, when you are invited to his house in Aspen, which I'm gonna say, unfortunately I was not, but I'm told uh, that he wakes up early in the morning and does a real like hour hike, serious hiking in the, uh, down Aspen. Um, he also helps to support camp, all ca Jewish camps. And the reason that I think things began to get hotter is philanthropists who were gonna be giving serious money wanted to know data. So for many decades, it was just good stories like, oh yeah, I got turned on to my Judaism. Um, or I remember doing ex leading services and you know, years later remembering that. Um, but someone who's gonna write a million dollar or $5 million check from their foundation wants more than nice stories, even though we as directors knew that camp was successful. So I think because of those donors, Foundation Jewish Camp and other organizations started to do um, proper uh, research on, are we getting the bang for the buck? Are kids really uh, gonna be more committed Jewishly? Um, are they gonna be more knowledgeable? Are they gonna light Shabbat candles more often or go to Israel or speak Hebrew or whatever it might be? Um, so I give a lot of credit to the Foundation of Jewish Camp, to Harold Grinspoon and to um, the Avichai Foundation uh, which just uh, closed. They were, they were sunset in October 2020. Um, but uh, they forced Jewish camps to kind of prove their success. Um, so Jewish camp is all about being outdoors. Um, some camps spend more time on the Zionism Israel piece. Um, some camps will spend more time on Hebrew, on Jewish observance, um, some camps will just be a camp where most of the kids are Jewish, but doesn't have much more than maybe Friday night or Shabbat morning. Um, the Y camps of New Jersey uh, is a very successful network of camp uh, camps. I think north of 2,000 people, a few different sites. Uh, the now deposed bunk, and uh, I'm going to say just a guy who really did terrible things. Um, as in uh, some, uh, Len Robinson is his name, was directed there for many years until women uh, came out just maybe two, three years ago to say that there was just bad stuff going on with female staff and he had to quit or was fired. But I quote him because he, he told me that sometimes when he would show camp to prospective parents, uh, some parents thought that the, the JCC camp was too Jewish because they might make uh, a menorah or Hanukkah or something in woodworking. And he said, okay, then if this camp is too Jewish, then go to this camp or that camp for you. Um, and some people said it wasn't Jewish enough um, because it didn't have a kosher kitchen or wasn't Shomer Shabbat. And he would say, okay, so go to Ramah. Um, unlike, I think it was Miriam who said like parents just sent their, sent you up to camp. Parents, I'm going to say for 30 years are much, that doesn't happen anymore. Parents would come up to camp with a, with a list of questions that American Camp Association would provide. I know those questions because they're, you can see from the American Camp Association website, you know, questions to ask the camp director. Well, okay, after a few times I got the hint. Um, and parents are, are much more deliberate. You can say crazy, I can say thorough. Um, checking out websites, visiting camp. Um, we had uh, developed a day in camp where anyone who wanted to visit camp for a prospective child could come on one day. So it didn't really disturb the fabric of camp during the other days. Private camps will generally have Saturday and Sunday as open houses, um, which I don't really understand because that means people just coming in uh, to camp. Uh, but I think people feel those who send their kids to nonprofit mission-driven camps, that it works. So I just want to share some data with you. In 2008, um, Foundation Jewish Camp uh, did a study um, that showed adults who attended Jewish camps as children were more likely to go to synagogue, marry a Jew, donate to Jewish charity, light Shabbat candles, and have an attachment to Israel. Um, they summarize it as the core elements are a sense of community, a sense of Jewish connection, and a sense of adventure. Three years later, in 2011, Stephen Cohen, 
also now defunct for the same reasons as the previous person I mentioned. Uh, he was a scholar um, and did a lot of research uh, on Jewish matters. In 2011, uh, he did a study um, of kids who went to nonprofit. We're uh, talking about Jewish camps on that uh, temple uh, website. You you would say that again. Can we yeah, ask? she saw. Okay. Um, so he did a, a study of all kinds of uh, nonprofit Jewish camps. And uh, here's what he found. By going to a Jewish camp for at least one summer, compared to a group of um, Jewish kids who did not go to camp, the kids who went to camp, uh, who are now adults, were 45% more likely to go to shul once a month, 37% more likely to light can Shabbat candles on occasion, 55% more likely to visit Israel, 25% more likely to give tzedakah to Jewish causes, 30% more connected with federation, 25% more to uh, more likely to have all or mostly Jewish friends, and 20% more likely to belong to a synagogue. Not to be outdone, six years later, Ramad did a study and you know what I've learned about studies and I'm sure many of you in your lines of work uh, know like, you know, studies are gonna prove what you want them to prove. Um, but uh, even taking that as my kind of cynical, uh, cynical comment on that, um, here's what the 2017 study uh, done by National Ramad. Um, being Jewish, the phrase being Jewish is important um, to Ramah alumni, the question was, how important is being Jewish in your life? How important is being Jewish in your life? 83% said very important, compared with 60% of children who were interviewed um, for another study, not a Ramah study, of uh, people who identified themselves as conservative parents from New York. So 83 versus 60. 54% um, uh, in another study. So clearly going to camp made you feel that Judaism was more important. Intermarriage rates, which I, um, I don't wanna necessarily open a, uh, a can of worms here because uh, there are people who have children who are intermarried and um, have grandchildren from intermarried families um, and we all love them and stay connected with them, which is very important. But if um, marrying a Jew, which um, now is a more challenging thing to teach to teenagers in camp. Um, when I was a counselor, we would have uh, Shabbat programming on, you know, marrying Jews, dating Jews, being with Jews. Um, for the last 10 years in camp, we don't, we did not do that so much because uh, a number of our kids are growing, but small number, uh, dad is not Jewish, mom is Jewish, or vice versa. But if intermarriage is a concern, this study shows that uh, amongst Ramah alumni, 7% of Ramah alumni report being intermarried um, versus 93% who marry Jews. And this connects with or compares to 35% in the study I described uh, um, earlier of Jews who, who identify as Jews. Um, so I want to, uh, so that's enough on data. Uh, I want to share a few quick, uh, donor centric, um, stories with you. Uh, one is, so we always have a doctor or Ramah Berkshire's always has a doctor in camp in addition to five or six nurses. And, uh, one doctor married, one person married a Ramah girl. Um, and one summer he came up to camp, he's late thirties. And, uh, a week after he was in camp, he sent a check for $5,000 to camp unsolicited, no homework done on him, no whining and dining. And I called him up and I said, like, this is a real significant gift for camp for someone who never gave a dollar. Um, and he said, well, I was there for a week. I love being a doctor. Uh, you didn't pay me. Um, I want to pay camp because I had such an incredible experience seeing that conservative Judaism has a good future. Um, so that's a great donor story. And, he, and clearly 
he saw the return on investment on being uh, kind of very serious. Then we did about five years ago, we did an online campaign for, uh, for young alumni. I'm gonna say young alumni, meaning people in their 20s. And uh, a check for $1,000 came in from a kid who's maybe 23, maybe, maybe 24. Thousand dollars from a kid like that age is is to me a very significant gift. Most of the gifts that came in from young alumni were eighteen to one hundred and eighty. And I went out for tea with him actually one day, and um, I said like, "What made you do that? That's really significant." He said, "There's only two places, Rabbi. I'm going to give. Uh, sorry, there's only one place, Rabbi. I'm going to give money to." Um, I said, "But you went to Brandeis University." You went to Schechter for 12 years. Those are part of your identity formation, just like Rama. And he said, no, they weren't. Rama really did it for me. And I, he then asked me how much is tuition for one summer, one kid. He said, I said, probably about $10,000. Um, and he said, well, I hope to do that in three years to be able to uh, add a zero to my, my, uh, my gift. Um, so as one who started getting more involved with fundraising, those kinds of gifts were, were uh, great. Was it Zuckerberg? Uh, Alavi. Um, but the, the largest gift up to that point when he gave it came from an alum who did very well in the financial world. He gave three quarters of a million dollars to start our uh, gym campaign, which really made it happen. It was a $2 million uh, project. Um, and he did it in memory of his dad. So I, I mentioned that because many of the donations that have come in over the years, even I assume since I've been working for CAM, were done in either memory of parents who at one point sent their kid to CAM and the kid kid who's you know in his 50s now or 40s want to thank that parent or in honor of grandchildren um, who are now uh, starting to uh, go to CAM. So the family connection and the family and the connection over generations in all summer camps is very, uh, is very, very important. Um, so a little more about me and Ramad Berkshires. Uh, as I said before, it's a real blessing to, to be in camp. And I think one of the reasons why summer camp is successful is that it gives great opportunities for leadership, as I mentioned before to campers and to uh, staff members. Um, you know, it could be reading Torah for the first time. It could be leading a service for the first time. It could be learning how to do the breaststroke. It could be um, learning how to live in an environment with other people. Countless college essays I read about what it means to live in a bunk and be able to negotiate life with everybody else 24 seven for the entire summer. Um, undoubtedly, though I've never done any research on it, kids who went to summer camp have a much easier time adjusting to college if they go away because they know what it means to share a communal shower. They know what it means to eat in a dining hall. Um, they know what it means to be away from their parents, to make their own bed, um, and things like that. Um, so what I learned best from campers was they would say that camp was where I could be my best self. Because at home, there's often pressure of academic challenges and social challenges and did not really allow for that kind of growth that summer camp did. Summer camp allows kids to fail and get themselves up and succeed because there's that incredible nurturing community of fellow campers of madrichim, of counselors, and, um, and other staff. And we certainly failed sometimes. When we would do intercamps, sometimes we would win and sometimes we would lose. Um, in fact, there was a rivalry between us and Ramah New England. They would come to us one summer, we would go to them one summer. And um, the last summer my son was in camp, I went by his bunk and it was Erev the day before Ramah Palmer was coming. And I said, guys, you know what? If we win half and they win half, Dayenu, that would be so great because we're all Ramah. They're New England, we're Berkshires. Well, my son said to me, Abba, that's like the stupidest thing to say because they wanted to win, right? Um, but failing is also fair, fair to say. So I wanna share a few 
um, I'm gonna say highlights of leadership in camp, because again, I think that's a great uh, thing that camps provide. Uh, provide. So one is um, sticking to the mission. So we uh, were borrowing the National Ramah Commission mission for many years. And about 20 years ago, we created our own. Um, one of the quotes that was often referred to is Ramah, and I'm gonna say other Jewish camps too, is a transformative Jewish experience for its campers, staff, families, and the communities of the New York metropolitan area, a place where Judaism is lived, Shabbat is cherished, and every moment is elevated. Ramah actually means height. It's the name of a biblical town in Israel. Um, and we often went back to the quote, is what we were doing... I'm sorry? Is what we were doing is that part of uh, our, our mission. Um, secondly is surround yourself with good people. Um, and uh, the key word here for me is good. Um, having brilliant people, having innovative, creative people, also very important. And I certainly don't diminish those uh, qualities, but having a good neshama um, is really important uh, for any camp for any institution. I'll take a, a tangent here and say, um, and I can say this now, not as such a newbie because I've been here for a while now, that the people I get to work with, uh, both volunteers and uh, the team here in the synagogue are all really good people and really are caring people. And that is a, a great work environment to be in. Next, something we learn in camp is being able to delegate. Um, here, I would say not everyone knows how to delegate as well as I think they could. And I am trying to work on that with people. Um, I love delegating. I love working hard, but I also know that other people know more than I do in certain areas and better. Um, and uh, I can be involved with a discussion or a you know back and forth, but um, I'm gonna say Cheryl will know a lot more about two, three, four year, year olds than I ever will. Um, and certainly uh, she should, you know, be listened to. So next is asking the right questions. Um, what did I learn at JTS? Um, more important than my improving Hebrew or observance or philosophy or Talmud was learning how to ask the right question to be able to delve into a text a little further. And for those of you who came to your peer cabal last week, know that this is something I just like to do to you know, really be able to go deeply into something. Um, and in camp, there was ample opportunity for kids to either learn in their daily classes or five days a week classes, or just hanging out with a counselor, you know, before they go to sleep. Um, and, and really being able to um, learn by asking the right questions from the right people. The following piece, we don't always uh, teach well in camp to the staff. Um, I don't say to kids because, you know, kids would often say to me, Rabbi Resnick, can we have a day off? And I would look at them and say, I wouldn't say what I really wanted to say, but I said, mm, every day is a day off for you, right? Like your parents are paying very serious dollars for you to be here. No, no, I mean like that we don't have to wake up for Tfilot and we don't have to do this and we don't have to do that. And I would say, no, that's not why you're here. Every day is a day off and you're not getting a day off just to sleep. Um, and so the self-care of campers, I don't know if we did well or not. Kids were, teenagers were always tired. Um, in the last few years in camp, we started to care more about staff members' own self-care. And uh, that was an important uh, kind of element to learn in camp, I thought. And then I uh, often think about, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I think President Bush number one said, uh, it's all about the economy, stupid. Is he the one? No, correct me. James Carville said that to Bill Clinton. Wow, I've been thinking it was, say no. that again, James Carville too. That's, that was the line that Bill Clinton used to defeat George Bush the first, was James Carville's suggestion that he say, it's, a, it's the economy, stupid. And hey, that's well, what Bill talked about. I will now uh, 
be correct in what I say. So what I used to say in camp, and which I say in my <laughs> life now, it's all about the relationship, stupid. Um, and I believe that like deeply in my heart and soul that um, uh, connecting with people and having that relationship, ooh, I don't know what happened there. Sorry about that. Um, is really important. So after I stepped down from being director, I was fortunate to do um, alumni development and fundraising for camp for three years. And so a lot of people wrote emails or sent letters and there was a dinner and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And some of the memories that, uh, they're not kids, right? They're in their thirties and forties now um, or turning 50. Uh, were of either stories or situations that I didn't even remember, um, but were impactful on the kid, not just with me, but in camp in general. Um, one kind of like fun thing that uh, we used to do, the assistant director and I would go around the first night of camp when the kids were there. First night of camp is anxiety causing for everybody. For the camper who's brand new, who's eight years old, to like the, you know, stubbly, cool 16 year old guy who's been in camp for eight or nine summers to the camp director. The first night, all of a sudden camp goes from a relatively quiet place to hundreds and hundreds of people, you know, and a lot of crying the first night, some kids getting sick the first night, some kids being sent up with a cold that no one told us about. Um, some kids, by the way, being sent with, sent with lice that we did not know about. Um, I'm convinced those parents just want to like, you know, us to take care of it. Um, and uh, by the way, we got smart. After several bad cases, we would call the parent the first night and say, you have two choices. Either pick your kid up right now or we're going to shave your kid's head completely. <laughs> what was shocking is that some people said, shave my kid's head completely. Um, wow. Okay, no comment about their parenting. But it's all about the relationship. So one story <laughs> we, we, we had was um, we used to go around, uh, the person who ran the small kitchen where the kids got to cook, baked uh, hundreds of truck chip cookies. We would go around to every single bunk and give the kids a cookie. Now this really irked some of the counselors because inevitably, sometimes you went to bunks that already brush their teeth and try to get into their routine. And, and Rabbi, it's my first night as a counselor, like, you know, they're, they just brush their teeth. And I would say like, okay, they brushed their teeth, like, you know, relax, everything will be okay. Um, so one of them sent me uh, a letter about this. And I, I thought like, wow, that was a very easy thing for leadership to do. And 20 years later, uh, they remember that. Um, so I, I, I try to continue that into, uh, into my work even now. One, uh, two more things about leadership. Um, one is um, that camp at the end of the day is a business. So um, camp had a board. The camp board could hire or fire me. Thankfully, they hired me for many, many years. Um, and there were people on that board who uh, were more knowledgeable about finances than I ever will be. Um, and I would say, in the last 10 years of camp, um, we start to get um, more business and finance people onto that board who really did this for a living. Um, and if the books don't balance at the end of the day, we don't have a camp. Um, and that's yet, I'm gonna say another piece one can learn from summer camping. I'm sure it's applicable to the synagogue, to any nonprofit or any profit for that uh, for that matter. And I want to end this part, um, and I'm just going to be speaking for another maybe five minutes, is learning how to tolerate, accept, and engage with people with differences. So those three words I actually worked hard on, on trying to come up with a phrase. It's not just tolerate, but it's tolerate, accept, and engage. So you can accept a kid in your division who's a pain in the neck or quirky or odd, but do you um, really engage with that person? In your bunk, it's harder to just tolerate or accept. 
you have to try to do some engagement or we try to teach the kids to do some engagement. Um, seven years ago, a, an alum of camp and of uh, another remote camp committed suicide. He jumped off the uh, Tappan Zee Bridge. He was 20 years old. And uh, I, along with a lot of uh, his peers, uh, attended the funeral. And you can imagine as a 20 year old, all the kids were in college, um, coming to a funeral of your friend from camp was really hard. And the dad spoke. And the dad uh, said that a lot of Romanics tolerated his son's existence, but a lot of them did not accept or engage with him. And I did a workshop in camp every summer after that about uh, staff members tolerating, accepting, and engaging with annoying, pain the ass, challenging kids or staff members. Um, and as Jews, I think it's something that that often uh, we could and need to do um, uh, better. Um, I know back, if you can think pre-COVID time um, in, uh, in our shul in, in Teaneck when we had Kiddush, like you do here, uh, there was one guy who was definitely a little off, you know, lives with his, with a, a friend, is in his 70s, he doesn't drive, he's probably on the autistic spectrum somewhere. Um, I've, I saw lots of people go up to him in Kiddush and say, you know, Shabbat Shalom, and just keep walking. And very few people went up to him, Shabbat Shalom, and talked with him, just like you would talk to a friend. Um, and that was something that we, we tried to teach in camp, and also, I think, something that people can take away from camp. So I'm going to include. I'm going to conclude, and then there's any any Q and A that you have or reactions. Um, challenges for nonprofit Jewish summer camps today. Uh, some of them were the same as the last summer I was director in 2016. Some of them are brand new. Clearly, COVID. You know, when when the cam when most camps decide to close, um, some camps uh, stayed open. By the way, um, anyone here of Moden? in Maine. So that is a, uh, that's a Hatsi Tatsi, very good, um, you know, eleven twelve thousand dollars $12,000 camp. Um, and they really know what they're doing. And they stayed open and they had a five week session. And for the first 10 days or two weeks, everyone wore uh, masks. This is all last summer. And then they took them off and it was a closed environment. Nobody left or came into it. And uh, my wife teaches one of those kids in, in school. And the girl said, like, it was just great. It was like a regular summer. You know, yes, the first two weeks you had to stay with your bunk and this, that. But then it was just like a regular summer. But most camps, Jewish, not Jewish, nonprofit, for-profit, closed. So that, I think a lot of places took financial hits. And nobody really knows what's going to happen this coming summer. Though I think in the camping world is a hope that camp will open in some way, shape, or form. Number two is a financial challenge. There's always a um, push and pull of how much to raise tuition. How much to raise tuition. Um, I know we were, I was on part of a call where there was a question like, are we gonna raise tuition in the preschool next year? Um, so the, the lay leadership of camp felt we always needed to raise tuition. There was never a year that was zero tuition raise. Um, and, but then maybe 20 years later, we said, you know, sign up now, much earlier during the previous summer, you'll lock in uh, the previous, uh, the current summer's rate. So financial issues for a nonprofit, always a question. And I think as parents demand better facilities, um, I'm not talking fancy schmancy, but you know, 30 years ago in Ramah, if you didn't take a shower Friday morning, you had no hot water Friday at four o'clock. Um, and now probably, I don't know, 80, 90% of the kids had warm or hot water. Parents demanded that. So financial issues are always a question and not wanting to raise tuition too much because then it might turn off families. And even though scholarship dollars have, have gone up, um, there was a feeling of, well, maybe some people might not even apply. Number three is security. Uh, so last summer I was a director, 2016, we saw some anti-Semitic, anti-Netanyahu uh, flyers about 
250 yards from the entrance of camp. And uh, though we have 24 seven security, which by the way, there was no security for 35, 40 years sure. until I don't know if people remember the shooting in, I think in a Los Angeles JCC, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, where oh, the guy- 20. Say Over again? 20 years ago, I was working as the youth director of the synagogue. We brought in guards when that happened. So 20 years ago. So that's when we started 24-7 because what we heard in the reports <laughs> is that the guy drove by different places and wherever there was security, he didn't go. And like the third place, he went. Um, so security is an issue. Camp is, is huge. It's well over 200 acres. Um, there's no fence. People come in on the lake. Um, so how do you secure that area? Um, 20 years ago, we started having staff, uh, have IDs 10 years ago, five years ago, we said, um, they need to wear their IDs, uh, during the day. Um, and I think for New York area Jewish camps, that's a real serious issue. Uh, my friends who run Ramah, Wisconsin, they had no security. And I couldn't understand how they had zero security and we had this whole uh, apparatus. Mm -hmm. Number four is Mishlachat. So I didn't talk about this much, but we bring Israelis over every year. Um, we used to have five or 10, it's been up to 40. How do we bring them over? What is their goal of coming? Um, how do we bring them over during COVID? Uh, but how do we bring them over even in healthy years? And what does that mean to bring Israelis? Number five is uh, LGBTQT campers and staff. Um, I remember probably six, seven years ago, we did a staff survey and we asked people, this was through Foundation of Jewish Camp, um, how they identified themselves. And several of our staff um, identified themselves as trans. Well, five, six years ago, I knew this much about what it means to be trans. And I really studied and learned. Um, and one of the saddest things that happened that summer was a boy who uh, went to a Schechter school, uh, went through camp for eight years. His last summer, uh, he said he just couldn't handle the pressures because now she um, said he just couldn't be in a boy's bunk with 16 year olds. And you can imagine 16 year old boys, what they do and, and all that. And he just could not handle it. Um, but uh, his mother just made up an excuse and uh, that he was allergic to something in the bunk, which was like totally ridiculous. Um, and it was only like months later that he came out to his friends. But that's an issue I think for Jewish institutions and certainly for summer camps. And finally, what's the long-term diagnosis on the conservative movement? Um, as I said before, Ramad grows, but what about the rest of the movement? Uh, most of our kids who went to Ramah Berkshire's, uh, close to 80% identifies conservative Jews, meaning they go to a conservative synagogue. About 20% go to Orthodox synagogues. Um, and what does that mean for uh, long-term vitality of summer camps? So to conclude, uh, one, thank you for the time. Two, uh, I think if you look around and see leaders in Jewish institutions, whether it's shuls or schools or federation, or JCCs, APAC, Israel Bonds, um, many of them have summer camp blood in, their, in themselves. Um, and I, I, um, I hope I was able to kind of like give some insight into some of the background and success of, uh, of summer camps in general. And I'll stop talking because I just noticed what time it is. Um, and if people have any questions or comments or reactions, um, I don't get paid by the hour, so you know I can be here, um, <laughs> Mr. President. What's the relationship among the various uh, Ramas? Is it all under one organization? So it's a great question. So there's a thing called the National Ramah Commission. That board, that's a separate nonprofit connected to JTS. That board is represented by each president of the local camp. Um, three or four people present, uh, appointed by the National Ramah President and three or four people uh, appointed by the Chancellor. They, um, they uh, 
have to approve the budgets of each camp, which now like everyone does it so professionally that doesn't really happen. And they need to approve the hiring of any director. And the, and the directors, we all love each other. All the presidents love each other. In fact, they go to a different Ramat camp every summer and their spouses hang out. Um, and there's, there's no competition, right? Because if you're the president of Ramah, Wisconsin, the kids from Chicago are gonna to go to Wisconsin. They're not coming to Ramah, New England. Um, and your successes could be shared with other camps. And often after those visits during the summer, my president would call me and say, Paul, I gotta tell you about, blah, 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 blah. Like, why aren't we doing that? No, no. And it was a good way to share, as well as if there's a problem, it's great to be able to pick up the phone and have people to share that with. Yes. Uh, uh, B'nai B'rith Perlman camps, have you heard of them? Is that conservative? No, that's sponsored by B'nai B'rith. Um, that's another nonprofit, I'm gonna say mission driven camp, right? They're not, uh, they have, their mission statement is probably a little different than Ramah. Um, and maybe a little more inclusive because it's not sp sponsored by a religious, you know, stream of, of Judaism. Um, okay. But as far as I know, they're doing okay. My two stepsons went there and I, I thought it was conservative, but I guess it's not. I, I think one of the directors there, uh, wow, a name break, uh, not coming into me, was a Ramah Poconos assistant director for a few years. Um, and I think there's a modicum of observance and commitment to Judaism. There. Right, a little bit, a little bit. A little bit, but more so yeah. than like maybe at New Jersey Y or something. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Rabbi, thank you very, oh. Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, okay, so one last question, Rabbi. If, if I wanted to send my grandson to a, 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 a good Jewish camp, you would be, and I tell you my level of observance, you'll be able to say, this is where he could go or should go. So um, not out of a sense of modesty, but out of a realistic sense. I know where my Berkshire is best, right? Okay. <laughs> I spent a lot of time there. Uh, I know where my camp's second best. I do know about most Jewish camps. Though what's really exciting is every so often there's like a new camp that is, could be five or 10 years old and I, I never heard of. Um, so I'm a, I'm a good resource and Foundation for Jewish Camp, um, they have an amazing interactive uh, website. So that is, uh, that's another good source. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Hey folks. No. Yeah. Uh, Rabbi, thank, thank you. Joe. Joe. No, I just want to. I just want to add something. Uh, uh, for many kids, uh, they they really live for camp, and they have sh very strong uh, camp relationships. They see their camp friends uh, uh, all year round, and uh, I I can understand how this uh, would help develop to becoming part of the com uh, conservative community, and uh, as those relationships continued uh, for years in the future. We have um, in the dining room in camp. The first thing you see when you walk in certain doors is the shidduch wall of probably about a hundred uh, matches that were made in camp. I'm sure it was a lot more than that. Um, but commitment, connectedness, uh, camp's all about making it fun. Um, so I agree with you. Okay, bye, Rabbi. I got to get off. Goodbye, Marion. Yes, it's 201. <laughs> All right, no, let, me, let me thank everybody who attended and let me urge you to attend future sessions if you enjoyed the talk. I hope you'll enjoy the ones in the future as well. Next week will be Ariel Grunberg talking about um, the Jewish National Fund. The week after will be Ethan Corzon, the son-in-law of Joe and Lori Brofsky. He's talking about voting rights. And the week after will be Rebecca Anton Osdor not sure yet what she's talking about. And then we have a bunch of speakers for January and February as well. Once again, let me thank all of you and let me thank the rabbi in particular. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Stay healthy. Thank you.